Hey guys, Dr. Mike Kizertel here for lecture number eight of the Training Principles course. The last principle of training, individualization. Previously, we've called it individual differences. Does it really matter? Not much, just a little uh, change in terminology. Exactly the same training principle. So what's on the agenda for today? First, we have to define two specific kinds of differences. One is inter-individual differences. We'll get to what that means in just a bit. The other is intra-individual differences. We'll also get to that just after that. We're going to give you guys the simple definition afterwards of what individual individualization really means. We're going to go through and do a technical definition, a technical definition after that, so you guys have really high-level knowledge. We're going to talk about why it's ranked last, because remember, remember, this is after all the videos, and they're, they're in order of importance. We literally consider at RP that individualization is the least important and last ranking principle. Why? We have really good reasons for that. We'll talk about those. We're going to give some examples of how to apply and misapply individualization, and we're going to talk about some pretty important programming applications, not a, a, a complete list, but a really good sampling of some programming applications that you can take away from from understanding that the principle of individualization is important and what its structure actually is. So, in inter-individual difference, we are asking the question of, are different athletes different from one another? Because remember, we're saying that when we have the training principles, they're kind of like a roadmap to building the best kind of training program. But if people are pretty different, that roadmap's going to have to be at least a little bit different too. How are different athletes different from one another? Well, here's a couple of really big examples, and there's tons more that we can think of. So age. Right? Would you really train a 13-year-old the same way you train a 57-year-old? I have to give that some thought. Probably not identically. What about limb lengths and heights? Have you ever tried to teach someone to squat when they had a normal sized torso of an average height, but they were 6'6 or 6'8? It's a very different lift mechanic and requires some alteration. Body weights, people are different weights. If you're doing running programming and someone is 270 pounds and wants to be a good runner, and let's say they're already lean at 270, they wanna be a really good hybrid athlete lifting and running, is it really going to be approached the same with volumes and intensities to someone who weighs 130 pounds? Is the pounding the knees and ankles take going to be the same? Probably not. Size and, and body weight is a big difference between individuals. It has to be accounted for in the programming. Sexes of individuals can be different. Males and females are not identical. There are distinct biological differences that have to be accounted for. Still deeper, and this is kind of the obvious stuff, still deeper are the inherent system design genetics for a variety of different kinds of responses. For example, genetics for adaptation. Some people just grow muscle faster than others. Some people grow muscle slower. Some people grow muscle slower but more consistently than others who grow very fast within the first couple of months or years and then they slow down more. All kinds of differences there. Fatigue management. Some individuals can have huge volume load programs and recover just fine. Other individuals at fractions of those volumes start to experience significant problems with recovery. What about staleness onset? What does that mean? Well, it's going to depend on our use of variation. So if an individual can continue to get great workouts, great stimulus, great improvements in performance from the same set of exercises for six months, another individual after only three months may experience a significant staleness effect where they just don't get the same thing out of the workouts anymore. If you give those two individuals the same exact mesocycle structure where both of them change at four months or let's say four and a half, one individual essentially alternating the exercises not nearly frequently enough for optimality and the other one too often. They could have gotten more out of just the same stuff for longer. Athletes differ from one another on uh, which muscle groups are weak or stronger relative to one another. So for example, Back in the transition between equipped powerlifting and raw powerlifting that occurred between 2005 and 2010 for the most part, there was a lot of equipped lifting lore sort of carried over into what raw powerlifters need. And one of those things was that triceps were always the limiting factor for the bench press. Now, they almost always were for most equipped lifters because the shirt helps you at the bottom of the range of motion and it makes your pecs maybe not obsolete, but certainly gives them way more help. The triceps have to press out all the weight pretty much at the top because the bench press shirt doesn't really do anything there. So then we got to the raw era and people say, you know, 
Bench press improvements all about bringing up your tricep strength. And for individuals whose triceps were a pretty big limiting factor or could stand to grow a lot more and get stronger, that was really true and it worked really well. But other individuals just didn't have big or strong enough chests and their triceps were plenty big and strong and they struggled off the chest and they would just fail at the bar right at the chest. And it seemed like terrible advice for them. And in fact, it probably was because it wasn't taking into account individual differences of the fact that their triceps weren't holding them back, but another muscle group was. So some different program design implications there. And there are like a, a, a trillion other factors that are different between individuals. That's not the only kind of difference that individualization has to account for, however. Intra-individual differences are changes within a single athlete over time. For example... Over time, adaptive resistance goes up, so more overload is needed to get probably, I was going to say the same effect, but really even worse effect. And if overload doesn't go up, nothing happens. So you need more and more and more to progress as you get better and better. So if you say, man, you know, that one program works super well in high school, I should try to do it again. That's not really good logic. In high school, you were a different person. You were probably smaller, probably weaker, and probably much less exposed to training so that your adaptive resistance wasn't that very high. You could have been doing a pretty crappy program back then and still got great gains because you didn't build up any adaptive resistance. Now, even the best program might not make you progress as much, which is just as an aside, a very interesting uh, note to make on individuals who look back over their training careers to try to ascertain what worked best for them. If it was during the same era of their training that they're comparing two modalities, that may be instructor. For example, in year seven of uh, an individual's training, they did a very, very high volume program, mostly. And in year eight, just one year later, still intermediate range uh, trainee, they did a very, very low program. And they got really way better results on the lower volume program than they did on the higher volume. Can they conclude something from that? Totally. But if they comp com compare different uh, training modalities that they used in different eras, that's really not much to conclude. So for example, that, that same high school example is saying, you know, I used to bench just once a week and I got great gains when I was doing that in high school. Later, like after college, I was training three times a week in the bench press and I just never got the same gains. Well, you're, there's nothing you can do after college if you've been lifting consistently the whole time that's going to give you the kind of gains you got in high school. And man, you could probably do like plyo jumps off a BOSU ball with your you know, push-up jumps and still get better gains in high school than doing the best program that Boris Shako can come up with uh, after college. It's just the way things work. So you got to be really careful that when you're comparing things across time, the individual is different. So the comparisons can get a little bit wonky and it's, it's really good to tread very, very carefully in that terrain. Your size changes, your strength changes, right? Individuals that have a lot of strength uh, can exert really nasty fatigue amounts onto their systems just by training not so much. You know, if you're deadlifting 300 pounds, you may be able to do five sets of six reps twice a week and just get really great because your fatigue doesn't accumulate that much. But there's nobody doing that with 800 pounds. If you changed over time and you eventually your deadlift was up to 800 pounds for those similar poundages or similar set and rep schemes, you may be able to do a workout like that once a month or once every three weeks. That's how much fatigue would accumulate. So things very much change as you get bigger, as you get stronger. Your technique improves over time. So the same technical fixes that used to uh, that have worked well for you in the past may be inappropriate and different weaknesses in technique can develop. You may uh, used to, let's say you shoulder press a certain amount, let's say you, sh you shoulder pressed 60 kilos for a set of five back in the day and you really needed to work on your clean technique and uh, you couldn't clean much because your technique sucks. So anything you could clean, you could definitely jerk. And you were a great jerker because uh, the, you were really strong in the overhead uh, movement, right, relative to your clean. But let's say your clean technique improved significantly. Now, with a 60 kilo for five overhead press, your jerk may be significantly lagging and you'll start to experience problems in the jerk and you'll start to wonder, well, why and all kinds of weird technical, you know, do I need super technical fixes? What's going on? The answer is that you're, where you were sucking, so to speak, changed because one area got much better than the other and one area that used to be the best was no longer the best. All this kind of stuff changes over time, which presents a challenge for programming. Over time, recovery ability goes up. You don't take 
a soccer mom on her fifth day of training and give her an elite bodybuilder's workout. She could die. And I mean that literally. Rhabdomyolysis has killed people, okay? It's when your muscles break down from too much stress and literally just go into the bloodstream, clog up your kidneys. Really bad stuff happens. Volume tolerance goes up over time because recovery ability goes up over time. You have to program that in. It gets a point probably when you're training about five to ten years consistently where you're going to look at your workout and you're going to go, ugh, this is so much stuff. And then you got to go, is it too much? And then you think, no, I can recover from this. Crap. And because adaptive resistance goes up over time, you go, this is actually what I need to get better. It sucks. Totally. If you like training, it's great. But if you have a love-hate relationship with training, you got to understand that as your recoverability goes up over time, it's the fastest path to gains is to make sure you're actually tending uh, to that by giving it enough volume from which to recover. And of course, there's a thousand other factors that change over time. So a lot of differences both between individuals and within each individual over time. So the simple definition of individualization as a training principle, just a layman's term, is people are different from one another and from themselves over time. Training should be adjusted to account for these differences. Training can't continue to be the same for everyone or even the same person over time. The technical definition is, of course, a bit more technical. Differences between and within individuals mandate the degree to which and the mode in which all of the other training variables are applied changes. Notice, and we'll come back to this in a bit, we're not saying some of the training principles don't work. They all work, and they work in the same way for everyone. But the degree to which we're going to be applying them is going to be changing. Sort of like every car needs an engine to go somewhere, but the size of the engine is going to depend on the size of the car's frame, what it's designed to do, etc., etc. So, for example, some individuals need more volume to overload than other individuals. They just plain need more. For some individuals, what is past their maximum recoverable volume is what for others isn't even maintenance volume. That happens. So you can't program the same volume for everyone. Some individuals grow from relatively heavier weights than others. And I don't just mean with strength because there's fiber type differences and there's probably a relationship between fiber type and relative intensity. Some individuals in some of their muscle groups work, grow really well from sets of five, sets of six, sets of seven, sets of eight. Other individuals won't grow much at all unless sets are 12, 13, 14, or 15 reps each. So there's differences there. Some individuals accumulate very little fatigue for a variety of reasons. Right, So they can get slammed with volume if needed because they don't accumulate fatigue very fast. Others accumulate fatigue a lot. And that doesn't always mean that those that accumulate fatigue grow less quickly. Sometimes it's the same individuals that make the greatest gains that also accumulate the most fatigue and require the most ad uh, advanced fatigue management strategies. There is a difference in technical acquisition and in technical proficiency, and there's even a difference in how stable your technique is without having reviewed it. For example, in a very technique-heavy sport, some individuals need to go back and review certain techniques more often than others, otherwise they get rusty at them quickly. There are some savants in sport that you teach them a technique once or once they've got it down, they just never forget it, and it's always crisp. Everyone else is on some point of the spectrum all the way to that individual who in uh, strength and conditioning uh, circles is a very politically incorrect term. Uh, it was called a motor moron. Uh, and it, as coaches use that all the time, usually behind an athlete's back. And that's when someone literally could barely be taught a technique. And as soon as they learn it, the two, two or three days later, they forget it entirely. Now, very few people at that extreme, very few people are savants, but everywhere in between is a degree of technical proficiency. And in the case of, the, is a, of this example, uh, there is a question of how often do you need to review a certain technique or group of techniques in order to keep that fresh so you can use it on the field of play. The differences between that means that you know, there's going to be differences in training program design based on individual athlete proclivities. So those are differences between individuals, but the very same individual can change on all of what we just said from one year to the next. All right, so we can't assume that identical programming is histor uh, that uh, to what it was has been historically effective is going to be effective in the future, right? Uh, we always and, and this is one of those real that second point is a real big challenge in programming and a challenge in getting better over time. As you change, what you require to be your best changes. The way I used to train years ago 
got me pretty good gains, but if I tried it now, it wouldn't get me very good gains at all. It could either be really pretty ineffective, or it could be way too much and get me hurt in a variety of different respects. If only training was about discovering which formula worked for you and then just doing it you know, forever. It's not. What works for you changes over time. So that's another big challenge of training that we have to attend to. Now, individualization is ranked last on all of the principles. Why? Isn't individual difference important? Yes, but individual difference or, or individualization, the differences between individuals, uh, both between individuals and within one individual over time, um, has often, too often, so often, been overrated where uh, any and every claim has been legitimated with, it works for me, but it works for me, right? Nobody, for no one does it work to violate the basic principles of training. Nobody. People do all kinds of really stupid stuff that violates the training principles, and they're still good in spite of themselves. They still get progress. And because they're violating a training principle or just not doing a very good job of exploiting a training principle, let's say their application of overload is sporadic. Let's say they don't do progressive overload as much as they progress every now and again instead of on a plan. Do they still get better? Yes, because they could have phenomenal genetics or just really good genetics for adaptation that even not very overloading things make them grow faster than the best kind of overloads for someone of average genetics. And they say, well, you know, my method of training works for me. What if they had another method of training that could have been better? This is a very important point. The it works for me is an important piece of information. It certainly means you're not screwing things up totally, totally bad. But remember that something else could have worked even better. And people take the it works for me so far that they start their training starts to look like real crap. They could have been, been better if they had done better. Imagine that you went, you took today's modern sport practices. And you took them back into 1895 when people were training for, you know, some of the first long distance races that were run in modern times. 1895. People were doing all kinds of stuff wrong back then. Can you imagine taking a time machine full of scientists and the best coaches, coming back and pulling aside the person uh, back in time that, you know, if, if he just ran the best race ever, so some butterfly effect events, the Earth wouldn't get destroyed by aliens in 2050. And in 2049, we find that out, we send back a team of scientists to get that person to run as fast of a marathon as possible. And that person like looks at all the scientists and stuff, everything's explained to them, they calm down, no longer have a panic attack, and like, you know, this, all this stuff is great, but I'm the best, uh, or pretty close, this stuff works for me. Yeah, but what about all this advanced stuff? It could work better. It will work better, right? Similarly, if you took a modern vehicle back to Henry Ford's office in the 1920s and he said, you know, our Model T worked just fine. Well, watch this. Everything your Model T does, our new cars do 50 times better and faster and cleaner in every conceivable way better. Did a Model T work? Yes. Did it get people from point A to point B? Yes. Did it revolutionize uh, modern industrial practices? Absolutely. Was it a great car for its era? You bet. But does it in any way compare to what we have today? No way. So wouldn't that suck if you were the kind of person that says, well, this works for me, and that entire time you were closed-minded to training practices that were already around that were better? Maybe not a ton better, maybe a little bit better. And when you play second place in your competition that you've been training for for two years, someone could come up to you, they're really not a nice person, and go, still working for you? You would say, oh, damn it, you try to choke them or something. But you could say, well, I did as best as I could, but did you really? Right? So people try to say that individual differences make them these totally different animals to whom sport training principles don't apply. There have been very gifted athletes in the past say, I don't train with weights because weight training doesn't work for me. Really? Increases in cross-sectional area and force production, power, and velocity do not advantage your game? So if a genie came down and said you could have extra added strength with no cost, you wouldn't take it? I doubt it, right? So this is one of the reasons why individual differences and individualization is ranked last is because it only modifies all of the other principles. Everybody needs overload. Everybody needs specificity. Every single living human needs fatigue management in their program. Every single training principle is a given. It applies exactly the same way to everyone. Individualization just modifies those principles so they can be applied in the appropriate manner in a program. 
which also, while it's listed last, isn't just because it has the least effect, though it does, it's also because it's listed last because it modifies everything that came before it. It's not as much its own training principle as it is a modifier to everything else. So, what are some examples of application of this principle? Well, one of your clients, let's say you're training clients, and you have one of your clients do eight sets of ten. Another of your clients, you may never go above four sets of 10 because even three sets of 10 for that other client is pushing the threshold of their recovery abilities. So if you programmed, let's say, six sets of 10 for both clients, just one program, right? the one ring, unite them all, one of the individuals would literally be overreaching and possibly eventually overtraining, terrible results. The other individual wouldn't be sufficiently challenged and it wouldn't be enough for them. That's a bad deal, right? Next, over-application. How do we over-apply individual differences? Well, it's when an individual thinks they're so different that regular training doesn't even apply to them. So, for example, if a gifted sprinter on your track team uh, runs three miles at night uh, by himself at home every day, three-mile run doesn't make you good at sprinting if you're any good already. It makes you worse. Right? And he's so gifted genetically, he says, hey, you know, it works for me. And that violates the principle of specificity. If he stopped running three miles, he would get better at sprinting, almost guaranteed. So we have to be really careful about that. An over-application of individual differences is literally clearly defined as violating other training principles because you think you're that much different. That's over-application. Under-application is very easy to define. That's when we simply give everyone more or less the same program. There's not enough of a difference in what people are doing. And then it's a bad deal because some people get much worse. Some people get uh, pretty good, but nobody really receives the optimal or very few people. So for example, a football coach gives everyone in the same workout with no accounting for differences in volume or responses or tolerances. So let's say it's five by five. Some people, they're pretty fatigued at two by five, but three by five is enough for them. And some people, they don't even feel the workout until six by five, seven by five. Why would you give everyone the same workout? Not a good idea. Lastly, some program design implications from the principle of individualization. So first of all, we've already mentioned this, but it's really important. Every single program must concord with the first six training principles. But the degree, not if it concords, the degree to which those principles are applied, right? how much overload, how much specificity, how often do we vary, what kind of structure do we use for phase potentiation, we're still phase potentiating, just changing it a little bit, those principles are all applied and altered based on individualization. So the first six are always applied, but the degree to which they're applied is a question for individualization. Right? It's kind of like every car has an engine, every car has a frame, every car has a transmission. The exact type of transmission, the size of the frame, the power of the engine may very well be different. But if you look on the road and look at the cars, cars all pretty much look very similar. Right? A child can draw a car and get the fundamental meaning of it. It's not really a car that instead of wheels has you know, spider tentacles that it moves around with, right? There are very vast similarities and only differences in the details of exactly what category applies in what sense. Now, if you want to use individualization, athlete monitoring is key. It is critical. What is athlete monitoring? Athlete monitoring is the collection of variables of data, how you're progressing, how you're feeling, what your weights are, what your body weights are, etc., over time to actually track your responses. Because remember, I felt like the bench press program I did in high school was better is a nonsensical statement unless you have actual hard data or at least a memory of hard data of why. You say, well, I went from benching 200 to 250 in 10 weeks. Okay, now we're talking, right? So if you want to really say, well, individually, this doesn't work for me, this does better, the next question is, how do you know that? And if you could pull out your training notebook and say, this is how, that's it, case closed. If you can't, that's cool. You don't need to justify yourself to anyone and you could very well be on the right track. But what about to yourself? When you're you know, falling asleep alone later that night and someone, you remember the conversation in the gym, like, how do you know this works best for you? And you're like, damn it, I don't know if it works best for me. I've just been doing it. And I got, you guys know how we all get a little bit um, 
defensive about our training practices. Why are you squatting like that? Because it works for me. Okay, geez, back off. Okay, great. Right? And then later that night, the person who said that works for me is falling asleep and he's thinking, do I really know if this works for me or not? Maybe it works fine. Could that person who had recommended a different squat stance, could they be correct? Yeah, maybe. But if you had a training notebook and a journal and you had experimented with the other stance before and you got terrible results for pretty clear reasons, like say your adductors just swell up and get too sore, there's too much volume for them, you have to bring your squat closer and then your quads get hit and everything's great, then you don't have to have a justification. You have one already, right? So if that person's like, so why don't you squat wider? You can go, we'll see my adductors flare up and it happens every time. Here's my training notebook. It happens three times in a row. It's good enough for me. And they go, oh, geez, okay, yeah, makes sense. Right? And they could not say that. They could say, well, I don't know. I think it still works. And then they're one day making the mistake, right? So yes, it's good to be monitoring. And one of those reasons is that some individual characteristics take a long time to figure out. So you don't want to be quick to assume that you have yours figured out, right? Uh, muscle growth response, for example. How do you know what grows muscle the best for you? Muscle growth is something that, unless you're talking about very, very rank beginners, takes months and maybe even years to figure out. So if you do a program for two weeks and you go, ah, this isn't, this isn't growing muscle uh, like I like it to, how the hell do you know that? Well, you got like a, like a super gravity chamber at home that analyzes muscle tissue down to the milligram or something like that? No, right? How do you tell if muscle growth has been improved? Well, visual changes, appearance changes, how your clothes fit, and repetition max differences, especially for multiple sets. If your five by 10 in the squat went up by 20 pounds, you probably got bigger muscles. If at the same time your pants are fitting tighter and your quads visibly look bigger and have more details, then you know that you've hypertrophied. But how long do those things take to visibly show up? Months. So if you do a program for a couple of days and you're like, nah, this isn't it, unless you're using good proxy variables, like you know that the pro workouts that get you pumped or that get you sore are the ones that usually make you grow. Ah, man, unless you have that kind of data, you really can't tell. So a really good part of sport practice is when you try different things, stick to what fundamentally doesn't violate any principles, give things time to figure out if they work for you. Because you could realize that every time you tried something, you didn't give it enough time to work. Another really interesting thing with giving something enough time to work is how you're testing when it works. So for example, if you're testing to see if a powerlifting program improved your strength and you do it right at the end of that program without deloading or tapering, you're going to be testing at a time of very high fatigue and you're going to look at it and say, well, I didn't get any stronger. But what about if you rested a week or just did light training for a week? If you do that, you get 30 pound PR in your squat. All of a sudden, the results are completely different. So not only do you need to take enough time to apply different variables to see if you, in fact, respond differently, but it also is a really good idea to make the testing circumstances as close to ideal as possible. Remember, you want the truth. You want that electron microscope of science. You don't want to just kind of look at something like, ah, nah, it didn't work. Then if you're going to do that, you might as well just take all your biases, put them together, and see if you can get a bias-driven program uh, and then that's easy to do. But if you really want the best results, you're going to have to be as precise as you can with testing. Whatever new thing you test out on your program, you have to give it the best possible conditions. Another really quick example is doing a hypertrophy program, but not eating enough to gain much weight. You say, yeah, you know, my eating wasn't on spot this last couple of months, but I don't feel like this program grew me much muscle. Well, how the hell do you know if it would have worked if you would have eaten properly? you got to give everything a really good chance to show itself. Now, once it doesn't show itself, especially a couple of times over and over, you can feel free to abandon it for the time being. Remember, as your body changes, you might have to come back to it, but you don't have to keep pounding away things that don't work. Just make sure that when you're closing the door on something, you've seen what's inside the room pretty well to know that it's worth closing the door. Last little tidbit, just a quick aside that always comes up uh, for strength and conditioning coaches especially. We have this really uh, fundamentally good sort of moral understanding that hard work is a good thing, and it damn well is. And from that, we get this idea that athletes that don't want to do a lot of volume training or don't train as much, that they're being lazy, they're sort of recalcitrant on the idea of hard work and there to be sort of uh, soci sociologically punished or looked down upon. Like, damn it, Johnson, you know, you're a lazy bastard. You don't want to work. That's why you're never going to be the best. There is a time and a place for that kind of stuff. But here's a cool, interesting fact. Individuals that have more fast-twitch muscle fibers 
benefit from doing less work because they can disrupt homeostasis so much more easily, because their fibers take so much more time to recover. For a number, a variety of other reasons, individuals with faster twitch fibers require less work, less volume for their optimal response. But their optimal response in strength, power, and speed sports is usually even better than individuals with slow twitch fiber types. So what does that mean? It means that some of your most gifted athletes on a track team, on a basketball team, on a football team, on a weightlifting team are going to be the ones who actually need the least amount of work. A couple of take-home points from that. One... Figure out what somebody's maximum recoverable volume is before you start yelling at them that they're being lazy. If they're getting really good gains and really good progress and they're doing a small amount of work, they're doing everything they can. That's a great thing. And if every time you push them into doing more work, they start to fatigue and tire out and it doesn't work, you can stop yelling them from being lazy because it's not a good idea for, for you uh, to keep pushing them because their physiology uh, doesn't really uh, benefit from that. Another thing is, there is a team culture in which individuals on a team, pretty much all the athletes, look to what the best athletes are doing and try to emulate it. But some of the not as great athletes on a team will be slower twitch on average in strength power sports than individuals on the team who are more gifted. Those will be faster twitch. And if the more gifted individuals are doing really well, and let's say they do only three sets of an exercise... The slow twitch individuals could come up to you and say, listen, why do you have me program for eight sets? Or they might just not even tell you anything. This is the worst part. They could just slack off and be like, well, what's his name's done? And he's the best on the team. Why am I still doing all this work? You got to be really careful about that, right? Because if that's the conclusion, what ends up happening is the slow twitch individual or slower twitch individual doesn't do enough work to maximize their responses. And then they do all the work. Months and months later, they go, yeah, but I'm still not as good as that person. You kind of need to pull them aside maybe at some point and be like, look, this is a gifted person. I mean, who knows how much better you'll get or they'll get over the years, but over the months and weeks, they're going to get better faster than everyone because they're gifted. And the thing is, that's not a very hard explanation because most athletes know that already. They've been on teams long enough through their whole lives to where they know who's gifted and who's not, and they know it's kind of pointless to chase the gifted people. you got to do what's best for you and for your physiology. And if you're slow at twitch, that means more work. And if you're faster twitch, sort of on the other hand... We always think it's top-down. The coaches are making the fast-twitch people do more work. Well, sometimes the fast-twitch people themselves get sort of complexes about it and go, man, you know, I want to outwork everyone. Well, hold on a second. There are people on the team that are slower twitch that you don't want to outwork because that outwork is going to be beyond your maximum recoverable volume, beyond what you can do recover from and benefit from. There's no point in doing that, right? So taking all that together, individualization is very important to apply to every single program. But individualization just modifies all the other training principles, they come first. But the question of how to employ them is an answer that individualization can provide. Folks, thanks for tuning in. See you next time for the last wrap-up lecture on this training principles course.